look, thanks very much, and it, it, it's, um, it's great to be here. I think the, the sort of hierarchy of things is that I start off with the government, and then Steve, uh, Andy's going to look at the uh, the role of TEXA, which is one of the is one of the key government initiatives. But I'm not going to talk about that. And then we'll hear something about the Office of Learning and the Learning and Teaching as well. So there's much more in the powerpoints which are going to be available to people than I'm going to talk about. And I've tried to highlight things that are more relevant to practice-based education. But as everyone knows, I think this is a time of uh, some activity on the part of governments. And late last year, we had many, many papers and things we were supposed to respond to. The ones I've chosen to um, highlight are the attainment agenda of the government, which is probably the government's major initiative, and closely related to that, their participation agenda. The government is also has a, a quality agenda, which is very much connected with international benchmarking, international co competitiveness. Cross-sectoral linkages are a very high priority for the current government. Texas in brackets, because some of us are going to talk about that, uh, even though it's a really important initiative. And I'll put the base funding review up there, though my suspicion is that it's not actually an initiative at all, because nothing much is going to happen. But, but there is a lot of talk around the base funding for universities. And I'll put a question there related to today, which is, in all of this, are people really paying attention to workforce needs? And one of the kind of themes of my, my presentation is that I suspect there's a kind of tension between most of these government initiatives and, and a vision for a university system that actually is well aligned with, with professional workforce, workforce needs. And in none of those is the idea of you know, where are we getting our workforce from, how we're best going to prepare the workforce, and all those sorts of things really front of people's minds at all, actually. So I think most people already know the attainment agenda, 40% of people are going to have a degree. That's now actually fairly, um, not a particularly ambitious standard by international in international comparisons. Uh, a lot of European countries have a target of 50% 50, 50 for people for degrees, but that, that's our target. And the main way they try to do that is this model of uncapped places. Universities can enrol uh, anybody, uh, anyone they, they see fit. And what that's done, actually, is not simply create more spaces for people who couldn't, wouldn't have gone to university, but it's really created competition and the capacity for universities to grow on the basis of people who would have gone to university anyway. So it's, it's kind of created, I think, a, a, a sort of perverse effect, which is the competition for people who would have gone to university anyway. It's not really increasing participation, but it is increasing competition. And the point about the 25 to 35 year olds in, you know, in 10 years' time is that that means that policies tend to be focused on school leavers to the expense of mature age students. But there have been opportunities, I think, before extending TAFE pathways and developing new models, if, if you're really interested in that, which certainly at CSU we, we have. Been. Some of the consequences for professional courses. We are in a demand-driven environment, and that's where the first uh, tension, I think, between workforce needs and the current model emerge, because we're seeing courses set up all over the place to meet student demand, which aren't particularly well aligned with any um, projections about workforce needs. Now, the most obvious uh, example are law, law degrees, which have been uh, thriving in Australian universities. I think more than 30 universities now have, have law degrees. And when I went to one of the uh, many consultations with DUI, we had the students from the, uh, the, the, uh, the Society of Law Students who, who were, all came from Sydney University and were all arguing that there were too many law schools and <laughs> what was the government going to do to stop this? Um, but at the moment, we, we see um, the expansion of opportunities to study professional, professional courses, whether this is well aligned with the predictions of workforce needs or not, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. One of the consequences of that is that the entry standards for many, many professional courses are now lower than they have been. If you just look at ATARs for entry to some of the allied health courses, for instance, they're they're, they're coming down. Um, social work would now be, of course, you know, you can get into somewhere in Australia, I suspect, with an ATAR of 70. Uh, if I'd say when, that would be right. Um, and, and the other consequence of that, obviously, is enormous pressure on PBE placements. So anybody who's engaged in that will be experiencing that. 
On the other hand, there's all sorts of responses to that, so I think we're seeing more and more interest in the university being able to provide its own PBE through clinics, through enterprises that the university runs itself, and of course new, new models of, of PBE simulations, and one I'm particularly interested in is, is how we work with people who are already in the workplace and how we turn their, their workplace experiences into some form of PBE. So there's a new models emerging. Again, the participation agenda is focused on <coughs> low SES, uh, which is a, a sort of complicated measure, which I won't, I'll be happy to talk about later if people want to, but it, low SES. But universities also have to have targets for other un underrepresented groups, and most universities have chosen targets that are either around Indigenous students or around regional students. There's something gets up CSUs and those, <laughs> those who are not CSU people because other universities get rewarded for enrolling students who are our, our kind of mainstream students. <laughs> uh, we don't get a special reward for enrolling students from Wagga, but if Sydney University does, they get extra funding. But, uh, and, and of course what that's leading to is much greater diversity in the kind of cohorts of students and more, more or less well prepared students. Um, at CSU we're particularly that's a great sentence, by the way, more or less well prepared. <laughs> <laughs> uh, managed to get you know, three edges, three edges of it. But um, the, what we're noticing at CSU in particular is gaps in mathematics, uh, which is really uh, um, hindering some students. But also more broadly, I would say gaps in cultural capital, particularly with people who are first generation students whose families have never been you know, near a university and, and we've got to work to help them move into the system. On the other hand, and I don't want to, I am someone who doesn't want to see participation and diversity as a negative, actually. I think this is a very important that the participation is bringing people into the universities who have very, very rich backgrounds, particularly in relation to practice practice based learning. You know, we're seeing people coming into our courses who've had kinds of experiences which, which students, we've never had students with those kind of experience much in the past, and I think that's a rich thing, actually. So just some questions more than anything else. One of the ones I think is really important is will participation be participation in all fields? You know, will the, the new cohorts, the more diverse people, actually go into what you might call the less prestigious professions? You know, will we start seeing 20% of low SES people getting into you know, medicine and law and uh, veterinary science and dentistry and physiotherapy? Or will they, will they be in you know, business and um, uh, early childhood, primary teaching, nursing and so on. That's a big, that's a really important question to me and I don't think people are paying enough attention to that. <coughs> the, the, the participation targets are global, they're not really tied to particular courses. Uh, amongst the people who are really at the forefront of participation are, are rural and remote and indigenous students because they're, they're the areas where there is um, some of the poorest participation rates. And as rural and remote people and Indigenous students come into the, the system more, what's that going to mean for our P P PBE models? And how are we going to support the PBE for, for people who are really rooted in their Indigenous communities, for instance? How are we going to support PBE for people who live in very small, you know, rather isolated communities? And that leads to this question, which is a more positive way, I think, of saying this. You know, will we be able to have models of PBE which actually value the, the, the diverse experiences of students? So just a few um, mentions about the, this, the, the government, the Commonwealth's concern with quality and international benchmarking. And by the way, one of the sort of things with the international benchmarking is that it's used as a way of, it's kind of related to the base funding review. Because whenever the universities come and ask for more money, what the government says is, well, show us that things aren't working. You know, you're churning out all these people in courses which are accredited by the professional bodies. Where's, where's the problem? And we all say, we need more money, we need more money, and the government say, what indicator is there that something's wrong in the Australian higher education system? And benchmarking is quite an interesting thing. Um, that the, in terms of, one of the things that's happening, and Andy will talk about this, is, is that Texas is developing its sort of notion of teaching quality and course quality, but the government, which is now, I don't think anyone's figured out how to pronounce that, but let's call it deserter. <laughs> the, uh, is, um, 
is uh, it is developing some measures that they're going to hold universities to in terms of teaching quality, retention and progress, uh, measure the course, self, you know, student reporting on their course experience, measures of student engagement, graduate destinations, and they're very, very keen to have some internationally benchmarked measure of generic skills, problem solving, um, analytical skills, communication skills, and so on. One, one, that, I think, provides space for PBE because we do know, I think, that PBE does strengthen student engagement, that it also strengthens retention, and it, it certainly strengthens graduate outcomes. So on those three key measures, I think it's important for people who are interested in PBE, that there's a very good alignment. And I think it works particularly well for some of the equity uh, groups as well, that, that engaging students early on in the course in, in practice-based learning does, I think, improve the outcomes for those people. On the other hand, I think the, the government's concern to internationally benchmark generic skills can sometimes come at the, the, the uh, expense of a focus on professional outcomes as well. And the, the debate in the sector is really about <coughs> the degree to which generic skills should be contextualised. I'm certainly a, a very strongly committed to contextualisation. I'm not sure that there are meaningful generic skills outside of particular contexts. But I think that that's where a lot of the debate will be. And I think the other question here is, you know, s supposing we administered a, a generic skills test to a whole lot of students, they didn't do well, and yet those students had all graduated from courses which had passed their professional accreditation with flying colours. How do you square that particular circle? What's the balance between these categories <coughs> and the professional benchmarking and, and the professional um, right, thanks to boring on. Um, I won't <laughs> say too many, too much more about this. this is, it's a major agenda. I think it's one of the things the Australian system can be proudest of when we have good cross-sectoral linkages and it's certainly a government um, initiative and a government uh, strong support. Most articulations been through credit type arrangements, but we are seeing now kind of joint programs where people are enrolling and kind of getting the best of both worlds by committing to do, in a sense, a TAFE course and a university course in a sort of integrated way. Um, I, I won't go into all of this, but one of the things I just draw to people's attention is this thing called iProud, which is a program we the CSU developed with the New South Wales TAFE and the New South Wales Police, and it's a focused, very specific um, foundation program which, which is for Aboriginal people going into the New South Wales Police through our police, uh, police education program. So CSU provides all the recruit education for New South Wales Police for those outside of New South Wales. And it's been fantastically successful. And it makes me think that in, in the Indigenous area, field specific foundation programs have a lot going for them actually. You know, we get people <coughs> moving forward into a particular area. Um, this, is, I think, will play a bigger and bigger role in uh, um, professional education. And one of the important things to think about, I think, with PBE is, is just how we value the skills and workplace experience, so forth, which vet students bring into courses when they come on these pathways, and whether we get it right, do we make people just repeat a whole lot of stuff they've already done, sort of thing. But the other point to remember is this one here, that nearly as many students go the other way. And that lots of people leave the university and can't get a TAFE qualification. People in universities tend to forget that, actually, because they want the kind of things, and, and that's another reason why it's really important, especially thinking about practice-based education, to, to remember what TAFE is doing. So the base funding review, again, um, I don't want to belabor this. Bradley recommended a 10% increase. It's not going to happen. Uh, the consideration of PPE costs, which is probably the thing most interests everybody here, is um, being postponed. And what, they, what they've said is this is a matter for state and commonwealth, so we've got to go and consult with state governments, you know, how we work with the state health departments, all this kind of stuff. So, you know, it's off in the, in the fairies. Sort of. um, the, well, it's off in the New South Wales Department of Health and places like that, so who knows what's going to happen. Um, one of the, I think these are the three things I expect might come out. There may be some revision to funding clusters and social work <coughs> and allied health that have been identified as areas that need looking at. I think there will almost certainly be a small new capital component, maybe 2%, which would be incredibly valuable to universities. And there's a program to sort of have what they call flagship teaching programs, which get special funding. 
but the students have to pay more hex to do them, by the way. So it's a way of, in a sense, deregulating hex as well. Um, and they're meant to be about innovation, a way of funding innovation. And the big link issue is the caps on Commonwealth supported places for postgraduate for graduate studies, which of course will cut across a lot of the fields here, where the model of um, you know, undergraduate degree and then a, an entry level graduate course is emerging in many professions, and that's. If, if, if some parts of government have their way, those courses may only be possible on a fee paying basis. So that's a big issue that's emerging. So that's it. Summary. I think there are challenges. There's challenges in the capacity of the system to deal with things. There's some funding challenges. I think it's also quite an exciting time because there is a capacity to support new models with, with new places. Uh, there's certainly wonderful new cohorts of students coming into the system. There's a great emphasis on the student experience. Uh, which I think is very important for universities. It's really galvanised universities to take student experience more seriously and on inclusion. I think there is a real tension between the demand-driven model and workforce needs and, and I don't think there's a lot of clarity about how we work that out and this postgraduate thing is a, a case of that as well. But if, if professions are saying the best way to meet our workforce needs is to provide opportunities for graduates to enter, how are we going to support that? And then there's this, I think, is a big, big question. What have I done? <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah. you know, that, uh, I think a whole lot of the professions we, we're working with are facing a situation where inclusiveness, putting it in a very positive way, is meaning a whole lot of different people are coming in. And how, how the, what does this mean for professions' identities and, and the, the role of people in forming identities and so on? But the most important thing to remember, I think, is that government policy isn't actually the only imperative that we should be making up our minds about what we think is important in the context of all of this. So thank you, Steve. <laughs> That's raised a lot of issues, so if you want to make comments or questions, please note them down and save them up for later.